What's up guys, welcome back to the channel, and today I'm back with another video, but this time once again, we're going to debunk some of the biggest narratives in the NBA currently, and for this video, we're going to look at the biggest narratives surrounding the best and brightest NBA superstars. And the narratives I chose to debunk, they come from the media, as well as fans, and even some of the players themselves. So without wasting any more time, let's get into this video and debunk the biggest narratives for five NBA superstars. So first up, I want to start out with the best point guard in the NBA, that being Steph Curry. And the biggest narrative with Steph Curry is that he needs three All-Stars or a super team to win championships. Also one of the side narratives is that he can't carry a team, which is also false. And when talking about Steph Curry, I feel like a lot of fans, they forget the first half of his career. If you guys remember, Steph Curry was drafted in 2010. He's been in the NBA for over a decade and his career didn't start in 2017. So with that being said, looking at Steph's career, he's already proven he can carry a team as well as win a lot of games and even championships without a super team. And this narrative right here is pretty easy to debunk. If you go back to 2013, Golden State that year won 47 games and they made it to the second round of the playoffs, they lost to the Spurs. On that team, Steph had zero all-star teammates. In 2014, once again, Steph had zero all-star teammates and Golden State won 51 games. In 2015, they won a franchise best 67 games and won their first championship since the mid-70s. Steph once again did that without multiple all-stars, his only all-star teammate being Klay Thompson. And once again in 2016, Golden State had the best record in NBA history, only losing 9 games. And on that team, his two all-star teammates are Klay Thompson as well as Draymond. But like I've said many times, that Golden State Warriors team, before Kevin Durant got there, was not a super team. They were just a very well-built team from the ground up, they were organic, and they had the best backcourt in the NBA, combined with an elite defender, as well as great perimeter wings, and a very solid bench. So when talking about Steph Curry, the narrative that he can't carry teams or win championships without a super team, that is flat out false, as in 2013, 2014, as well as 2015, 2016, that narrative is completely disproven. Now next up, our next narrative to debunk involves Giannis Antetokounmpo and the overall sentiment that he can't be the best player in the NBA because he isn't skilled and that he isn't a skilled basketball player. And there's many routes you can go with this skill debate when talking about Giannis. Obviously, he's not a Kyrie Irving, a Steph Curry, or even a LeBron James when it comes to overall skill. But when it comes down to it, Giannis still has a very good baseline of skill built into his game. And one of the big time problems NBA fans as well as media members when they talk about Giannis, they ignore all his positives and focus in on his very slight and minute negatives. And if you ever encounter someone like this, you know, they'll appreciate it more, you know, but I wish I could just run, run and with seven feet and run and just dunk. Like that takes no skill at all. <laughs> I gotta actually learn how to play basketball and how to have skill, you know? The response I would give them is that why isn't every seven footer who's super athletic as dominant as Giannis? Why isn't Bruno Caboclo an All-NBA player and MVP candidate? It's because he doesn't have the skill level of Giannis. That's what makes Giannis so deadly and so special. He's extremely athletic, very tall, but he also has a very good foundation of skill. Again, not the most skilled player, but when it comes down to it, he still has a very high level of skill for an NBA talent. And right now in 2021, I think Giannis has a very good case of being called the best player in the world. But still, there are some big time detractors who say Giannis can't be the best player because he isn't skilled. My response to those people would be, was Shaq ever the best player in the NBA in 2000, 2001, or 2002? Because undeniably, he was a dominant force of nature, but still, he was not very skilled. And he had a very fatal flaw, that being free throw shooting. With this love fest that is broken out here at Staples. Oh, playing. I could hear that. I could hear that <laughs> at Venice Beach. But I am very confident 90% NBA fans would definitely say Shaq was the best player in the NBA during that point, even though at that time, Allen Iverson, Tracy McGrady, as well as Kobe, were more skilled basketball players than Shaq. So when talking about skill, I think Giannis is actually kind of underrated, as seeing some of the things Giannis does in the basketball court, being seven foot tall, you've really never seen someone like that since Will Chamberlain, how he handles the ball, how he drives, how he dunks. Those things are highly skilled and also very impressive. And I think Giannis still has a very good case of being the best player in the NBA, despite his game still having some flaws when it comes to the aspect of skill. 
Now, next up on our list, we have LeBron James, a name some of you guys may be familiar with. And when it comes to me and LeBron James, it's a pretty rocky relationship. Why do you hate LeBron? I like LeBron. You hate LeBron. I do not. I think he's actually a very nice guy. And one of the big narratives for LeBron all throughout his career is that he is not clutch. And I'm not the biggest LeBron James fan, but this narrative is simply outweighed by the facts. And I'll start off by saying LeBron James in his career, yes, he has choked, specifically the 2011 finals. I'll give Thank you that. Hold on, hold on, hold on. He was a disaster in the fourth quarter Skip. of that game. A Skip. disaster. Okay. We're going to leave it right I watched it with these two lazy repaired eyes. But there are numerous moments where he comes up big in the biggest games. And the one series I would look to is in the 2016 finals. In games five and six, LeBron had 41 points. In game seven, he had a 27-point triple-double. In those last three games, he averaged 36.3 points per game, 11.7 boards, and 9.7 assists. And speaking of the biggest games, LeBron in Game 7s is absolutely phenomenal. For his career, he averages 34.9 points per game, 9.8 boards, and 5.5 assists. And that 34.9 average is the highest in NBA history, yes, higher than Jordan as well as Kobe. And also looking at some big time games in LeBron's career, ever since he came in the league, he's been a fairly good clutch player and he's evolved into a very, very good clutch player. If you go back to the 06 playoffs, his first ever playoff series in Game 5 versus the Wizards, he had 45 points, 7 assists, and 6 boards, and also added in the game-winning layup. In 2007 versus the Pistons, he had 48 points, scoring 25 straight points for his Cavs team, including 29 out of the last 30 points, and once again had the game winner in that Game 6. And looking to his time in Miami in 2012 in Game 6 versus Boston, he had an iconic 45-point, 15-board, 5-assist game on 73% shooting and a pivotal must-win game in the Boston Garden. In 2013 versus the Spurs in Game 6, he had 32 points, including 16 in the fourth quarter, and propelled the Heat on to a Game 7. And in that Game 7, LeBron once again balled out, having 37 points, 12 boards and 4 assists on 52% shooting, and the Heat won their second consecutive championship. And even looking at his second stint in Cleveland, he had some very good clutch performances. Of course, the 2016 Finals, but also in 2018, he had some big-time clutch games. In Game 2 versus the Pacers in the first round, he had 46 points on 70% shooting, and once again added in the game winner. In Game 7 of that same series, he had 45 points on 64% shooting. In the Eastern Conference Finals, down 3-2 in Cleveland, he had 46 points. And in Game 7 in the Boston Garden, he had 35, 15, and 9. So I hope my point kind of gets nailed home. LeBron James, when it comes to being a clutch time player, the positives heavily outweigh the negatives. Lewis gets it to LeBron for three for the win. Yes! LeBron James at the buzzer! West plays the inbounds. Battier gets it in. Here's James on the drive for the win! 1.5 remaining. James for the win. It's good. LeBron James at the buzzer. Three seconds left. Cleveland triggers in. James, two seconds. One second for the win. Oh LeBron James delivers. Going to be James. Oh, here it is. Three, it's under, it's three under seconds three. to go. Throws up the floater. Oh. Oh. Good night, Cleveland. That is for you. Now, moving on from LeBron James, next up, we have his big-time rival, that being Kevin Durant. And the big narrative surrounding KD is that he can't carry a team. And I'll say it up front, Kevin Durant has put on some very stacked teams. Of course, those Warriors teams, as well as teams in OKC, as well as Brooklyn. He's been on some very stacked rosters with some very good talent. But I think when you dive into it, Kevin Durant has still proven he can carry teams. And the first year I would look to is a very underrated season in 2010 when KD was 21 years old. This year, he averaged 30.1 points per game and OKC won 50 games in a very competitive Western Conference. And you would think for a 21 year old winning that much games, he definitely had a stacked roster. But that is definitely not the case. At this time, Westbrook was 21 years old. He was putting up 16 points per game and he was not even close to being an all-star. Also, James Harden, he was a rookie averaging under 10 points per game. And outside of Russell Westbrook, Jeff Green was the only other teammate in double figures when it came to scoring. So in 2010, KD carried a very young OKC team to 50 wins and a playoff berth. 
Also in 2014, he once again carried OKC to a very high playoff seed. This time, he had the second best record in the West, winning 59 games. This year, Westbrook was out for 37 games. In those games, KD led OKC to a 25-12 record, which is a 55-win pace for an 82-game season. Now, when talking about KD and Golden State, it's still kind of a sore subject, but I think there's one specific game in 2018 which shows Kevin Durant could still carry a team, that being Game 3 of the 2018 Finals versus the Cleveland Cavaliers. In this game, Durant had 43 points, 13 boards, and 7 assists on 65% shooting. He also added in a dagger three-pointer to see that Game 3 victory. Now, once again, this Warriors team, they were stacked and they were loaded. But in this game, he had no teammate help. Steph and Clay were both bricks, shooting a combined 7 for 26, and his best offensive option was JaVale McGee. It happens. Damn! <laughs> and even now in Brooklyn, KD has shown a very good ability to carry teams. And this series I would look to is in the second round versus the Bucks. And I would break it down two different ways. Games 2-7, through seven, when James Harden was injured. I would also look at games 5-7, through seven, when there was no Kyrie, and still an injured James Harden. In both those stretches, Kevin Durant put up all-time great stats, scoring the ball at an extremely effective rate. And his two biggest moments came in Game 5, we had 49 points, 17 boards, and 10 assists on 70% shooting, and in Game 7, once again, he was phenomenal, playing 48 points on 47% shooting. So in both those time periods, Kevin Durant did not have multiple All-Stars, and for the most part, was carrying a very depleted Nets team. And I think all that evidence right there, once again, shows Kevin Durant he can carry teams. Now, the last NBA superstar we have is Kawhi Leonard, personally, my favorite player on this list. And one of the narratives I see with Kawhi Leonard a lot is people trying to downplay how great he is compared to his NBA peers, specifically the A tier of superstars. And in recent weeks, I've seen a ton of lists don't have Kawhi in the top five. And I think that is absolutely foolish, as Kawhi Leonard is an absolute machine, specifically in the playoffs. And looking at 2021, before his injury, he was on an absolute tear, averaging 30.4 points a game, 7.7 boards, 4.4 assists, on insane 57, 39, and 88 splits. And he had a true shooting percentage of 67.9%. Now, let me just try to put into perspective how absurd those stats are. In NBA playoff history, there's been two players ever to average 30 points per game with a true shooting percentage above 65. That being Kawhi in 2021 and Kevin Durant in 2019. Outside of that, there has never been a player in NBA history to accomplish that feat. And even looking at a bigger sample size in the past four years, from 2017 on, he's been an absolute beast in the playoffs, averaging 29-8-4 on 51-38 and 89 splits. And during that stretch, there's only been two players in the NBA who had a higher scoring average, that being LeBron at 30.7 and KD at 30.6. So not having Kawhi in your top five player list, in my personal opinion, is a big mistake. And I think the overall narrative it isn't an A tier plus player is simply ludicrous and lacks a lot of thought. So that right there is the end of the video. And that was me debunking five NBA player narratives of Kawhi Leonard, Steph Curry, Giannis, LeBron, as well as Kevin Durant. Let me know your guys' thoughts. And if you want a part two of this video, Give me some other NBA superstars who will be featured in part two. Guys like Westbrook, Kyrie, or even James Harden. So with that being said, thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you guys next time.